Please don't sing. Why? You're not good at it. Ah, is it? Uh, I don't care. Uh, so, anyways, uh, competency gap. Yes. So, uh, no, 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 no. It's 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 just it's just the uh, Danny Kruger. Oh yes. <laughs> so so I just simply don't care. The, the famous effect, yeah. Yes. Good so for you. let's let's uh, start uh, from what I gathered when while we were talking before the actual thing. Today's session is going to be on Ansible automation, orchestration, and all that jazz. Uh, this is the ID show, and let's roll the intro and see what is going to happen next. Okay, my idea for this episode was related to previous two episodes that we did. And we said that we are going to do like a piecemeal approach towards most of the services that we, uh, were on those, um, on those roadmaps. Some of them may be, may be, may be multiple per episode, etc. Et but Ansible deserves more than a few episodes, actually. We can talk, both talk about that one for many, many hours. So... Uh, I would also like to talk a little bit uh, about the um, Red Hat education related to Ansible 2. You recently had an exam that you passed for that one as well. I passed it a couple of years ago. And uh, so the topics today are going to be some practical examples, some simple stuff related to Ansible, uh, some, let's say, recommendations in terms of how to learn. Okay. And perhaps some, let's say, a vision for some of the future episodes that we might do with a little bit more complex topics related to Ansible. Today, we are going to keep it simple and lean. We're going to talk about some, some playbooks, the idea behind Ansible, the idea behind infrastructure, uh, infrastructure as a code. And I'm going to show some examples of the YAMLs that I prepared recently for our students, actually, who are getting ready for a competition a couple of weeks ago. So I have fresh examples that we can use. OK, you just triggered me. I did? Yes, because you, you said because you use the word we are going to a uh, word uh, we are going to be uh, simple and lean. Okay. So we are switching to lean uh, development. Yes. Yes. Agile, yes. Yes. Lean. Yes. Agile lead and yes, so on. And so on. Yes. Um, let's start from the beginning because I want to ask a thing. Uh, okay. The thing is this: uh, Are the servers supposed to be pets or cattle? I don't care. Yes, you do, because you are right now proposing the Ansible orchestration of the way and everything else. And the uh, this is the cattle way. OK. The pet way is just to have your own private server for server from and uh, carefully craft everything that is running on the servers. And to be completely honest, this is what most people do. I don't care. I, I like both approaches. They both have their use cases. So that's why I don't care. OK. Uh, I would actually argue uh, perhaps in a little bit of a different direction. And this is the reason why I like Ansible. I, I think that you're going to kind of like uh, agree with that. No, no, no. I like, I like Ansible. Let's, no, let, let, okay, let's, just, let's just agree on agreeing. Yeah, that's good. Okay. Let's, let's agree on agreeing and then we're going to start disagreeing. Later. Yes. That's good. Good approach. Uh, the reason why I like it is not only because of the fact that it enables me to do uh, orchestration and automation. That being said, I really do not do not necessarily like the YAML format or corresponding formats that a lot of other, let's say, DevOps approaches use. I don't like the XMLs, I don't like the JSONs, but this is something that's kind of inherent when you're an engineer, because we used to have college courses about that 20 plus years ago when the state of technology was vastly different to what it is today. Back back in those days, you didn't even have an editor or a plugin in, let's say, a browser to check what XML or JSON actually are that you today have. But the, the real reason why I like it is because it enables me to do almost everything that I ever need to do in IT with one tool. The reason for that is because I can work with both open source and Windows because it supports uh, also... Um, uh, you know, managing uh, Microsoft-based operating systems. 
which means that I can extend that to any kind of cloud, whichever virtual machines I'm running. It's very well suited for anything Kubernetes OpenShift related as well, which kind of like goes naturally. And also at times it helps me immensely to configure other things that are not necessarily just physical OSs or virtual machines or containers, stuff like, let's say, switches, sometimes even storage devices, load balancers have loads of uh, additional modules for Ansible. And uh, recently, a couple of weeks ago, I delivered a training for one of our clients. They wanted to do Cisco call manager management via Ansible. Yes. As well. So I point, pointed them in the direction for that. So basically, most of the things that I would like to do, uh, or most of the things that I cover in terms of infrastructure components, vast majority actually of them are doable via Ansible. That's my take. Oh, okay. But my, my take is that uh, love it or hate it, you have to have some uh, standard file format for whatever. <laughs> you have to have, okay, uh, YAML or uh, JSON or XML or whatever. You have to have a standard format. So love it or hate it, you have to have one. Okay. So it, it is going to be structured. YAML from those free by a country mile. Yes, but okay. But I'm pretty much more of the XML guy mm -hmm. because I have some some um, things about YAML that I passionately hate, That's okay. especially the tab spaces and so on. But yeah. uh, yes, indentation is indentation. Indentation is a problem. So I'm not in Fortran uh, days anymore. So I'm not going to uh, to play with the things that remind me of Fortran. But, but why? Anyways, so powerful, anyways even today. Uh, I completely agree on Ansible based on a completely different uh, idea. Okay. For me, Ansible is basically the reverse of documentation because it creates, it creates the idea that I can uh, configure something and at the same time, it is completely documented because the, if the Ansible playbook gets works, uh, that uh, means uh, works, the documentation, th yeah. this means that I know what I installed, how I installed it, and I know that uh, this playbook is going to change the configuration to comply to my documentation. So basically, we have gone one step, one step further from normal uh, programming. Normally, you program, then if you have the time, do the documentation, or you try to make comments. In this particular case, your entire configuration is the documentation itself. So every server is listed, every services is listed, all the relationship between services are listed and everything else that is running is listed. So it's an amazing tool. First and foremost, <laughs> you need to know the fact that he actually means that, but he also means that to trigger me because he knows what I think about uh, this uh, verbal diarrhea that he just made. So uh, because of the fact that I know how very tidy you are with your documentation, and just so that you know, I'm, okay. I'm of the same ilk. For me, uh, using Ansible as a metaphor for documentation is just like saying that eating crap is cool because sorry, but it's not. Um, and this is the reason why at times I've um, offered a little bit more than let's say just regular support for VMware products because they enable me to do documentation without any hassle. Uh, just today, I finished one of the NSX, NSXT courses for a very cool crew from uh, EMEA region. It was a private training for a very big company. And actually, I've, I've spent a gazillion amount of uh, minutes explaining to them how very tuned NSX as a platform to do security and networking and routing and all of those beautiful things is actually towards the idea of documentation, which I know that we both agree is one of the Achilles heel of IT. Because documentation in general for IT in most of the companies that I've ever been uh, to, not only doesn't exist, it is something that if you mention it, somebody is going to hit you with something in the head. I think that we should be creating a complete episode on documentation because this is one Agreed. of those topics. One of those topics that uh, always create uh, heat and create uh, unnecessary discussion about the, the reality that needs to happen. The necessary discussion on the reality because to be okay. Let's sum it up just uh, simply. Uh, I haven't met a company that had complete documentation, mm -hmm. and I think that uh, one of the most important takeaways from all the documentation that I ever saw in any every company uh, that I worked with was that if they thought that they have a document, uh, the mm -hmm. complete documentation, it was even a bigger problem than when they uh, thought that the documentation is not complete because they were depending on something that was obsolete. 
this reminds me of a story that our colleague tell, told me yesterday. He wrote a um, uh, his degree, undergrad degree, yes, and he had no references. And then his mentor told him, "I'm going to probably going to try to get you a Nobel Peace Prize because you have no references, which means you invented all of that." That's exactly what you're talking about. Yes, you know? yes, this is one of those things. And the other thing is that uh, I quickly googled up. There is a doc generator, the computation generator from Ansible playbooks. Yeah, I know, I know. That that can convert it to uh, meta files that are going to be created on the mark in in the markup so or markdown. So. Uh, documentation is one of those things, but okay, I completely agree on Ansible. Ansible is a great tool. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, it has its own problems. It does. Let's start with the biggest one right now. Is Ansible going to remain free? Yeah, I have no idea. And we touched on this on the Red Hat episode a while ago, which was also quite popular. And a lot of people have been asking the same question. I know that um, uh, Jeff Gilling, who, who, was the, who is working on the Ansible a lot, dropped the support for the Red Hat. Yeah. And this is one of those things that make you actually say what is things going that make on. You go, mm -hmm. Yes, because what is going on, the Ansible is supposed to be a Red Hat uh, derived uh, technology. Mm -hmm. So it came from the Red Hat and now to not have support for major playbooks in the Red Hat is something that is, com that is completely off the rails. Yeah, I, I noticed a lot of chatter about this in the open source community. And I, I can tell you that people are already up in arms and saying that if uh, Red Hat does something about that to make it less than open source, that they are going to fork the old version and start developing it on their own. I know that this, this has been heavily discussed uh, online and I can definitely understand why. Because uh, having no capability to run Ansible code after running it for many, many years, because some policy shift that's crazy that kind of reminds me of a discussion that we had today on discord with our students you know uh, the the company that owns the unity framework you know they decided yeah, 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 that yes, they're know, going to license per installation stuff like that so basically if you install a unity based game on a, on your five computers that you paid for you're going to uh, the, the developer of the game is going to have to pay five times the license for the Not game installation only or something that, like the that. The problem is that they are now, right now trying to make developers sign new contracts mm -hmm. that are basically going to make them uh, pay for the games that are already on the market for mm -hmm. years. And this is completely insane because... Uh, I mean, this is what worries me in terms yes, of Ansible. This, this is one of those things. Okay, but let, let's not talk about Unity. The thing that I want to talk about is... Does this remind you of, uh, just as a policy shift, does this remind you of when Oracle bought uh, MySQL? Yes, yes, exactly. That's that's the metaphor that... And I think that... that MariaDB, and I have to say that that metaphor scares the living crap out, crap out of me. But MariaDB is live and kicking. And I think that the, the, simple, the simple solution is simply to just go, okay, they're going to fork the project and it's going to be better. Yeah, but it, it's about the modules and the roles and, the, you know, all of the other things that are involved. That's, that's what scares... A lot of people what's going to happen there because if they skip that and start doing something on their own it's going to be problematic okay i now, would understand why they would want to do that from a business perspective and nothing else there is no other reason uh for me i don't even understand the business perspective why would they, would they want to do it uh it could be just short-term gain if, uh, financially Mm -hmm. But I think in the long term, it is going to be uh, something that shouldn't be done. Uh, and I have no, I cannot not even think of any scenario that makes this viable as a business decision. So let, let's, let's, let's think that they are not going to do something like this. Exactly why we did the licensing episode yes. recently, because these sorts of overnight policy shifts in terms of how licensing works, etc., are a detriment to IT and they serve one purpose and one purpose only. It's only about the money, nothing else. And I think that right now the it's about the money and it's right now it's about trying to uh, reposition themselves because uh, there is a big repositioning going on. Uh, Red Hat and IBM are doing the repositioning on the open source market. Uh, Microsoft is trying to do a reposition themselves on the, um, on the cloud market. Uh, Google is repositioning themselves. Uh, everybody is cutting down everything they can, so they are uh, cutting and down raising costs. Prices at the they, same raising time. prices, cutting down costs, uh, removing services, removing uh, limits on services, and so on. So these are the things that are happening mm -hmm. every day. Yeah, 
Okay, so just to, to <coughs> further elaborate the point of uh, our previous discussion, which was documentation, I agree that if you want to really implement infrastructure as a code via Ansible, you definitely need to know how your infrastructure works, which is kind of like the process of documenting things while at the same, same time not being the same. I would uh, make an exception for anybody who does the things that I oftentimes do, uh, especially my shell script code, which is to heavily uh, comment it. So that that's that's what uh, those are just some of the things that bother a lot of people. I, I I have to be honest. I haven't done millions of hours of work with Ansible. I don't have uh, like a hundred different scripts uh, that I have in Bash, which is why we published the. Bash scripting book on Amazon. I don't have that uh, that metaphor on Ansible. I do have some dozens of the uh, let's say YAML um, YAML playbooks that I do, and primarily uh, for the the stuff that we do while working. That's it. Um, the second part of that story is something that I'm doing for PhD, and I have immense amount of Ansible there, but that's not for that's not uh, something that uh, I it's would share. commonly used every day, yeah. but. Uh, the other thing that I just wanted to uh, touch also as a part of Ansible and all the orchestration things, uh, almost every other project, including the Ansible, almost every pro project that is uh, that has uh, been there uh, for years and years uh, ran into the same problem. They just uh, are right now started to look like what happened to Java or to JavaScript. So they have more uh, modules. JavaScript, but yeah. They have modules, they have independencies, they have dependencies, they have uh, different uh, frameworks. Ansible has playbooks that are depending on the playbooks, that are depending on the, on the modules, that are depending modules. on the roles, that are depending on whatever. And you suddenly have, uh, you suddenly have a repository that you need to basically use the Google to search for the true. Mm -hmm. You have a lot of mutually incompatible uh, modules that are trying to do the same thing. Mm -hmm. You have a lot of, um, I would say, a compatibility problems mm -hmm. that make you uh, work more than you should. So okay. for example, this is starting to look like PowerShell. This is starting to look I mean, like... Uh, two versions. Yes. Oh, okay, I get it. So this is starting to look like uh, that you are going to... Uh, you need to relearn parts of the Ansible each time a major change occurs and major change, changes are occurring uh, yearly. Oh yeah, they introduced that new type of uh, CLI command and user yes, collections. Yes, and and see, yeah, yeah, yeah. Once they change something like this, everybody needs to update their modules. Some of them don't get updated and suddenly you have different versions that are uh, behaving in different ways. Mm -hmm. The idea is the same, but... Uh, we are talking about operations. Operations are not uh, designed on ideas. They're designed on actually functioning. So functions should be behaving as we expect them to behave. Agreed. There's one other point to be made about documentation. And this is not for uh, the, the topic for our future episode. This is related strictly to Ansible. Thank you for finding a module. Uh, I know that it exists. I want to touch on something else. Ansible is one of the pro projects with the best documentation available. That's my take. Yes, it could be. Uh, I would I would uh, go with OpenStack as one of the projects that also have a good documentation. No. If it weren't for uh, laziness of people who are doing some of the projects at the uh, OpenStack. Uh, the storage part of OpenStack documentation is awful. Yes, you know, th this is the exact model that I was uh, want to mention. The Swift module and the Cinder, 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 yeah. Cinder are basically completely unusable because they are just there to as a placeholder for the documentation. And not only that, if you wanted to add NFS storage to to OpenStack and you go to documentation, even with uh, with our 20 plus years of experience of working with config files and whatnot, you're going to have a hell of a time doing that. Uh, I know Still. that I know that uh, NOAA module uh, has excellent documentation. Yes. And at the same time, uh, it is as good as the uh, uh, CIS documentation is not. Mm -hmm. uh, good. So this is just Ansible has a documentation that is especially for the modules. Yes, not yes really yes. well documented. A lot of examples, very well done. And I think this is one of those things that uh, Red Hat, as Red, Red Hat being Red Hat, does uh, great. Yeah, agreed. Because they have a great documentation team. Yeah. And then, then when they are um, 
able to concentrate on the single thing that is actually inside uh, uh, part of the inside process they are able to document it and to maintain documentation to be concise and to be up to date Agreed. because one of those problems that, that usually the open source pro uh, open source projects have is that the first thing that is uh, that starts to lag behind the main project is the documentation cool, yeah. it's it's something that always happens yes and the other thing is that some uh, it comes to a point where you simply cannot trust anything that is inside documentation for example for podman for example, or Docker or whatever you call it right now, I'm expecting the container uh, CLI to exist and I'm, I'm expecting that we are going to get a container uh, CLI function that is going to be part Docker, part Podman and... VMware already has it, so I don't see the reason why not. I see a couple of reasons why not. <laughs> no, I don't. <laughs> so uh, if they make a CLI that works both with uh, Docker and Podman, I haven't checked if such a thing exists, that would be cool. This is the problem they are trying to, but always somebody is pulling in one direction while the rest of the team is pulling in another. So uh, you suddenly have uh, compatibility things. And this is coming from uh, me because I'm used to uh, Unix uh, or Linux like uh, operating systems to drag on the uh, compatibility with different modules in Bash, for mm -hmm. example, for decades. Mm -hmm. You, uh, some com some commands right now that are run, running in Bash are not running in compatibility mode that is compatible to the, the commands that were running in 30 years ago. Absolutely correct. And this is something and that doesn't happen in Ansible. Yeah, I would also argue that uh, throughout the Unix and Linux history, we, we made an episode about that as well. Uh, I would argue that our start in the IT industry in terms of Unix and Linux I think you very well remember very well what the documentation looked like. There was no documentation. Linux didn't have anything until LDP project, etc., which is in stark contrast to what we have today, of course, which is good, and also in stark contrast to what uh, Ansible has, which is good. This is what we want. Uh, Do you remember you you know man something and minus minus help something in Linux gazillion yeah, times? Yes, because you there is this the only thing that you uh, you could have, but. On the other hand, the documentation that you had was up to date with the current version of the uh, document that you had. Yeah, and this is th this is also good mm -hmm. because right now in the in the uh, ChatGPT slash Google world, uh, when you are googling for something and this has changed for three times in the last five years, mm -hmm. and you suddenly end up with a lot of uh, syntax error and a lot of errors that are completely. Uh, indecipherable to somebody, to somebody who doesn't have any enough um, enough experience with the Ansible. And uh, while we're on a topic, uh, I just want to say one sentence about uh, ChatGPT related to Ansible. Uh, we both used it recently for, to play around with some stuff. It it is semi good. It it, it always is. Uh, ChatGPT is as good as your prompts are. And after I started adding additional information and pointing out the errors in the code that it made, which of which he made many, then it started correcting and correcting and correcting. After, let's say, 10 tries, it tends to make the correct YAML for something that I asked for, uh, providing that it's not too complicated. But I'm completely fine with this. Me because, too. Because I, I consider ChatGPT, when it comes to automation, uh, to be it in itself an automation tool to enable me to uh, write down the uh, basically the uh, structure of a playbook so I don't need to think about YAML mm -hmm. I don't need to think about comments mm -hmm. because I can I can state in my prompt to the chat GPT please write me a playbook that is going to have this comment that's going to do this 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 and this and it creates a structure that I can then uh, just fill in with um, the comments that I'm uh, looking for so I think that uh, ChatGPT serves an enormous role here because it is going to create uh, playbooks that look ni look nice. At least that, and then you can debug and them for the, practice. And then and you can you can then uh, put the logic in. Yeah. Okay. So uh, the next topic is going to be about education. There are loads of available uh, videos on YouTube about uh, Ansible. I checked, and there are quite a few on Coursera and Udemy as well. So the topic of Ansible has been beaten to death in terms of the video materials uh, quite a lot, substantially. Uh, but uh, most of them that I had the chance to check, and I checked quite a few, 
are not really up to speed with something that a lot of people like, which is a structured learning process that ends up in certification, which is what you did recently and I did a couple of years ago again. Um, this is one, one other reason why I really like working with Red Hat. Uh, because their material for uh, for Linux Enterprise Linux, Red Hat Enterprise Linux Automation with Ansible, so Red Hat 294 course, the book and the labs and everything. I mean, uh, especially when you uh, kind of like uh, compare that to the exam topics, the, the generalized comment that we can make without revealing what's what's on the exam is that the book covers and the and the, uh, the 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 course and the labs cover everything that you need to know for the exam which has always been the red hat way which i really like unlike some other providers for example microsoft and vmware have a different policy uh, i dislike that but it's up to them to do whatever they want and having the chance to work through that material first time around a couple of years ago during the covid era when uh, i had to pass the exam uh, actually gave me insight into something else which is very important and it's in part related to your the topic that you mentioned earlier which is Red Hat when they put their money into it they do good, good things like Ansible documentation and the, like that course as well because it, it's really good. Uh, yes the course. And so I would recommend that course for anybody who wants to really d dig very deeply into Ansible. I think that uh... I see only one problem with the course is that uh, they're missing uh, an introductory course to Ansible. I think that uh, the course itself is amazing. The way it handles the topics is amazing. I would suggest it wholeheartedly, but in no way or form uh, is this easy. It's That's why you have uh, are aged one, one to four and one to one three four before that to learn all of the necessary basic system admin skills. After that, I think you are kind of ready. Although I would argue that in those courses, I think Red Hat should put back some more services for I configuration so that you can clearly see the difference between the way in which we used to do it and the Ansible way. Yes, but the the this the the, the Ansible uh, and the different things that you can do in Ansible are covered so much in depth that I think this course should be an expert course or a mid, um, I wouldn't call it introductory, but I would call it, let's say, a it's normal an engineer level. level. That's not yes, an associate okay. level. Okay. Okay. But I would, I, I would, uh, I would like to see an associate level for Ansible and for the orchestration. I think they have one. I don't just remember. To, just to make, uh, I think they have a refresher course for this, but, uh, uh, they also have, uh, I think, at least two advanced courses and troubleshooting as well. Yes, and the pro the problem is that uh, when it comes to the when it comes to Ansible, now let's talk about orchestration. The thing that is the biggest problem for most of the administ administrators or DevOps engineers. guys or engineers, however they call them, is how to mentally switch from um, uh, pets to cattle. So how to mentally switch from uh, okay. administering a single server. How to mentally switch from administering single service based on a single server on six, okay, or two servers, database, or or and whatever, whatever, but whatever, uh, to doing something that needs to be completely dissociated from uh, being able to run on a single server that makes any, uh, that uh, has any meaning to you. You need to be able to create services that are able to run on one, two, or 200 servers at the same time. And it is, I think, the same leap that you have to make uh, when you try to go the next uh, to the next level and go to the uh, dockers or the containers. Exactly the reason why I proposed this topic after two uh, DevOps because related the, the, episodes. The, 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 problem, the problem with containers is that uh, suddenly the problem is not with the DevOps guys. Suddenly the problem is, is, is with the actually developer guys, the developers. Because if the developers... Suddenly. Because the it's the, not suddenly it's been there for but a while. In the in the uh, DevOps world, you can fix pretty much everything that the developers do wrong if you are able. No, to, you can't. If, Most if, of it. If, if you are able to uh, reconfigure the from your side something, but when it comes to containers, no way. Mm -hmm. If the containers are not done in the in, in the in the way that they should be done, so as a separate microservices you have no way to uh, solve this problem, uh, even if you try. So the Ansible is similar to this. You can scale something, but the problem li lies in your hands. So you need to understand how to scale from one to, or two to 200 computers or servers or whatever nodes. 
and how to uh, solve the problems that this is going to create. Yeah, uh, I want to also touch a little bit upon the history of products before Ansible and I want to talk about the current state of the market for it before delving into code because I think that there has there have been some recent news which you touched upon as well they're very important I mean the idea of these orchestrated services autom a kind of automated configuration of the service let's let's go there for for a second which is what Ansible used to be used uh, for a lot of times is actually nothing new it used to be done in the, in the past by first creating scripts and after that we got tools like puppet for example, to do or chef clothes, or uh, whatever, doesn't really matter which one. Uh, and a lot of these utilities nowadays have fallen, let's say, in terms of the amount of people using them. And more to a point about, um, uh, let's say, open source Ansible relationship and whatnot. Recently, HashiCorp also, uh, I think, was bought by somebody, uh, the company that, uh, that does Terraform. Okay. So there is a big reshuffling of the cards happening on the market. And yeah, so Ansible is actually in a good position here to kind of like just stick to the vision of what it's always been and just keep on doing it. The only thing I think that the uh, the Ansible is right, now is right now is missing is the uh, part that uh, solves the problem of initial install of all the servers. And this needs to be usually solved by cloud init. And I don't, uh, I don't think that... I think it should remain this way. Yes, I, I, I think it should. I, I think it should be remain this way. But uh, from what I'm seeing on the market, I think that cloud in it is falling behind because they're expecting that everything everything is going to be sold by Ansible, and at the same time, you cannot solve some of the things. A cloud in it shouldn't be just a tool to deploy the machine and then deploy the SSH no, no, no. key, and then uh, uh, get the rest done in Ansible because. This is not the way to do it. No, no. Uh, I think it is the correct way to do it. Uh, you just need to look into that problem from a time, timeline perspective, because if you are looking at uh, configuring your virtual machine completely, the start of that process, if we, we usually talk about VMs there, is a template of a virtual machine, which has cloud in it kind of okay. started. The deployment process, if you go that way, next step logical is going to be cloud init to reconfigure host name, IP address, whatnot. Although cloud init has loads of modules that can be used for a variety of things. And then the next logical part, which cloud init doesn't do well, is actually the part that Ansible does very well. So they are very, very compatible in terms of starting point, middle point, etc., from the timeline perspective. But there's another point to be made here which is that a lot of times you don't start with a template of something and you start from scratch. You start from scratch, but you still have the cloud in it. And this is the reason no, why no, no. I wanted... There, there's actually something before cloud in it that we also need to mention. For example, in Red Hat World, we have Kickstart. Kickstart can and do... Anaconda, a, and Anaconda. Anaconda. You can, yes. Yeah, you can do a, an amazing set of things during and post installation with that as well. So cloud in it after that is also a logical next step followed by Ansible. This is the way in which people usually do it. I, I would, I would, uh, okay. Ansible cannot solve one problem. No. And I see that uh, this problem is something that you cannot solve with any tool uh, other than either Kickstarter or uh, cloud in it. Mm -hmm. And I would pretty much like to go with cloud in it way because it's just compatible with all the other different uh, Red solutions. Red Hat and CentOS lately have been implemented yes. it by default. Yes. I mean, so, for me, it's in the way and I and want this, to remove this, it. This part, this part is the thing that happens before the networking is initialized mm -hmm. because what I hate to do is having to reconfigure the networking with Ansible because it creates enormous amount of mess and uh, problems. It's not only that. There are so many problems with networking stack configuration in Linux nowadays. I just spent today, I spent an hour trying to work out the way in which I can force a, net, a stupid network manager to act as it should and take the DHCP address, NetMask gateway, whatever, and I'll take the DNS name of the machine and then set it as host name, which it doesn't want to do. So the solution to, my, to that problem for me was I just created a four line script and I was done. The fact that this, uh, actually most DHCP servers do not do this properly and networking services uh, corresponding to the client request for, for the DHCP. So DH client, for example, in Linux doesn't do it properly. It pisses me off to know, and we have loads of problems in classes for that, because all of our VMs are called the same. They are not. They have different IP addresses. Uh, this is one thing, and the other thing that I actually uh, think 
went really down the hill is when the different uh, Linux versions uh, started to uh, get their own DNS servers up on the local machine and then doing the queries to the local DNS server that is going to connect to other DNS servers. Like Ubuntu. Uh, like Ubuntu. Mm -hmm. And then uh, suddenly you lost the ability to quickly reconfigure the DNS. But this is not a Ubuntu problem. This is a system daemon resolve daemon problem. Yes, yes, I know, I know. But the system daemon, uh, from my perspective, and from what I see in production, is more or less going to uh, create problems with your uh, network configuration probably a couple of times a year, a year mm -hmm. for no particular reason. Agreed. It's just going to lose the uh, idea of which DNS servers are which, and it's going to switch to a server that's got, that shouldn't have been a third backup or tertiary backup uh, server just to make things work if everything else fails, and just stay there. Actually, to your point, and uh, you didn't know this because we haven't discussed this prior to um, uh, recording this episode. Actually, uh, the timeline that I was talking about, the discussion that you started, like clone the virtual machine, cloud in it, whatnot, this is exactly a couple of examples that I have uh, for our um, viewers and uh, let's say listeners today, uh, because this is one of the most most problematic parts of using the combination of uh, all of the aforementioned things, especially Ansible, and especially when you're dealing with uh, cloning of the virtual machines and this problem with uh, you know DNS hostname CTL and whatnot problems that you have and you will have them. This is beyond uh, actually annoying, super annoying things. And the things, the thing uh, that Ansible actually, cannot uh, cannot uh, solve. you cannot fix them. Yeah. Yes, yes. The thing that Ansible cannot fix are networking problems and kernel modules. You can uh, go around those problems. Yes, you can go around those. And problems, you go back to the old way, scripting, echoing. You know. Yes, and this is this is just a patchwork that then... Uh, okay. I do that regularly as, exactly for those reasons. I cannot do it properly and reliably. I'm just going to do it but shell But I don't think way. that Ansible, Ansible is ever going to do it uh, in modules because okay. simply, simply they don't have any incentive to do it. Okay. Uh, not enough people are in this mess uh, in such a way that they need to, I don't know, dynamically reallocate uh, kernel modules. Okay. But I don't... I, I've run into this a couple of times, and it was in very, 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 very specialized cases. Mm -hmm. And uh, basically, it almost made no sense to uh, even orchestrate it or uh, create automatic configuration out of it. I just created a shell script that was running uh, or firing up when the machine was uh, going up, and that's it. This is an excellent point that I want to build on for a, uh, for a second. The stuff that I do for my PhD work is related to uh, a lot of advanced stuff related to Kubernetes. But one of the fundamental parts of Kubernetes, which I'm going to say it out loud, pisses me off like hell, is actual process of deploying Kubernetes, which is complicated for no reason whatsoever. If you want to deploy, let's say, classic Kubernetes uh, environment with, I don't know, free worker nodes, and let's say a couple of control nodes that host all of the necessary services so that you can start running your pods and whatnot. If you want to automate that, you're gonna spend weeks developing Ansible code for that. I know I've tried it, okay. I had uh, um, this pleasure of deploying Kubernetes from scratch in command line gazillion times. And I use Ansible for, uh, we used it for many, for years now. So it took me an afternoon to do that. But it was still, why does this need to be so freaking complicated? So that's one of the things that I'm trying to uh, work on in my PhD. And the other one, which you haven't touched upon, you were t talking about the things that Ansible isn't good at. There's one other thing. Uh, they're trying to kind of fix that problem in the latest revisions of Ansible with some of the visual utilities that you can use to edit the code, etc. This is by no means a solution, but it is actually a, a step in the right direction. I am actually working on something much smarter than that. And uh, trying to implement some things like that in real life, I hope that I'm going to be able to finish this. And then afterwards, I hope that I'm going to just open source that so that everybody can enjoy it. Because um, a, a regular person starting to use Ansible, more to a point about the level of the course and knowledge, normal people starting with Ansible should not uh, be in a situation to you know keep the baseball bat hitting on, on your head, trying to work out why some stupid Ansible playbook doesn't work or how to write it. But this is one thing. And the other thing is that... Um... User-friendliness of Ansible generally is non-existent. That's my point. What is 
my pet peeve or what pisses me off is that uh, sometimes I'm trying to learn something about uh, let, let, let's talk about Ansible because this is the uh, episode about Ansible and say okay I'm trying to learn Ansible mm -hmm. and then you realize that it is almost the same as Java frameworks yeah uh, suddenly you have a way okay I want to configure uh, Let's call it a stack because it is a stack. Yes. I want to configure a group of machines that are going to perform something. Mm -hmm. I need a load balancer. I need some sort of a front end, back end, the database, whatever. Exactly the example that I'm going to yes, show. Yes, the the examples that are you you going to show because they are the, the things that you are actually going to day to day. Common. Yes. Uh, I can use Cloud Ini to configure individual machines. I can then use something like Ansible to reconfigure those machines to uh, fall into something that resembles something. Or if I'm uh, working in any uh, structured environment like OpenStack, like VMware, whatever, they have their own separate tools to group those machines into stacks that uh, you want to use. Okay. I'm using, calling, using this uh, term stacks because in OpenStack, it is a stack mm -hmm. and it is a stack. So basically it's a cluster of uh, the machines that are doing something. and the sheer amount of things that you need to interconnect to uh, create this uh, this cluster is what's the biggest problem in learning ansible because openstack is much worse there yes yes much and, worse and the hot uh, or the the heat the uh, how the 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 their orchestration uh, service is called heat the files are called hot <clears throat> okay uh, so the heat itself is basically trying to do something that ansible does in Without any reason for it. In a different way. Okay, I understand why. Uh, they okay. have a reason because they are trying to connect to their own APIs to uh, configure different services. Mm -hmm. So it has a place inside the OpenStack environment. But at the same time, this means that you need to create first a uh, cloud init for individual machines. For mm -hmm. the, Then you need to create templates. Then you need to create uh, hot files for to deploy the stack, and then you have you need to use uh, Ansible to get all of these things uh, patched up, connected, uh, patched and up working. And working uh, <laughs> you can also do it through hot, but nobody does it because everybody knows the Ansible. Yeah. So right now we have four different things and, and technologies that are complex that you need to learn in order to just create a simple thing. Okay. Two things. Uh, while we're on the topic of OpenStack. My pet peeve with OpenStack is uh, making OpenStack work in terms of networking out of the box when you deploy it from scratch. Trying to work out the way in which OpenStack works with the network interfaces, physical network interfaces, which one you're going to use for the management network, which one you're going to use for overlay networks and whatnot. The last time I did it, I wanted to basically take a, uh, take a baseball bat and break all of the monitors, all of the keyboards and everything around it, because after 10 different tries and dozens of hours of reading the documentation, it was still putting the API on a wrong interface and didn't want to work properly. Generally speaking, making OpenStack API routable tends to be a very, very fun project to do. You need That's the you, first you, thing. you have anger management issues because no, 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 when, no, no, when I, I see when I open an OpenStack node and do uh, IP route and do uh, just just to see what is happening, so to see the routes and do an IP config to see what is happening on the interfaces. And when I see those hundreds of bridges mm -hmm. uh, happening in every node, I just start like, laughing. So it just... That's the way in which it's done. It, uh, yes. What can I do? Yes, but okay, let's, no, let's not... There's a second thing that yes. I wanted to add. Uh, you mentioned Cloudinit again. So let me say something about Cloudinit in the context of the examples that I'm going to do. Cloudinit is the only thing that I deleted and this this like completely disabled on the machines where I am going to show you the demos because it was in my way. Okay. Cloudinit has this uh, nasty this, ability to do this that. This distinct yeah. problem that uh, once you configure it and uh, forget that uh, it is there, it is going to mm -hmm. keep break, uh, keep rearranging things uh, behind in its own way. In yes. its own way. So uh, don't. It, it, uh, for me, Cloudinit is like the OCD man. OCD dude that always needs to put things in its OCD places every single time after you reboot stuff. Yes, and uh, it tends to it tends to forget that this is not the first boot, and then you exactly then that. you have a problem. But uh, 
I am completely fine with cloud in it. I'm completely fine. I'm completely, completely fine with Ansible. What I really don't like is the way that right now the projects uh, themselves are not communicating and they are not trying to create, okay. they are not trying to create, uh, I would say a solution that would be, uh, that would have defined boundaries. Mm -hmm. So Ansible is trying to get into the Cloudinity's way and Cloudinity is trying to push into the Ansible's way. So it's trying to do the post installation scripts. Uh, which can be handled by Kickstart. Which which can be handled. Okay, let's let's right now think that Cloudinity should be replacing Kickstart. I and, disagree with that. And but Kickstart okay, shouldn't exist. Uh, uh, should exist. No. Uh, any, For any, installation, yes. Any uh, any um, unattended install scripts other than cl Cloudinity shouldn't exist. We should be agreeing on this so that we can have a unified way of creating unattended scripts. What do you have against Kickstart? Nothing. I would ju I just think that... For uh, deployment process is awesome. Yeah, just, but I don't think that it is compatible with the rest of the Linux uh, okay. distributions. Actually, while we're on the topic of that, don't get me started on the, on the Kickstart alternatives for Ubuntu because I've spent a couple of days working that into my PhD thesis. This was, it was a nightmare of And this is the reason, this is the reason, because yes. you, uh, uh, saying that you have a single solution that works, Kickstart, mm -hmm. and uh, saying, okay, this is good for the, the Linux community, is completely false for, uh, from my perspective, because you need to either create a Kickstarter alternative to uh, all the other mm -hmm. distributions that works, or just agree, okay, let's just uh, uh, put everything that we have into um, uh, creating cloud in work, uh, cloud in network that works, okay. and say, okay, we are not going to develop our own uh, versions of antenna scripts. Yeah, pre-seed for Ubuntu is very poorly documented and the way in which it's getting used, it took me quite a while to understand. So definitely not user-friendly. But okay, that's point taken. So uh, before we start with some of the examples and some of the use cases, do you want to share any other experiences or maybe questions or topics about Ansible that you feel close to your heart that need to be perhaps, you know, discussed? Um... I do, but you can yes, go first. yes, I know, and you shouldn't be allowed to. Uh, Why not? And now I'm going to be very, very, uh, let's say, uh, not only positive. I'm going to be very joyful. And this is the examples. this is the main reason why I shouldn't be allowed to uh, <laughs> share your ideas about Ansible, because you look too joyful right now. Why? Uh, the, but the problem is that uh, the problem is that uh, with Ansible, I have no, uh, I really have no problems. It is. Uh, it has a small footprint. Mm -hmm. Okay, it is a little bit confusing when you first when you first start. The latest with, deployment with all of those containers and whatnot is really confusing. Yes, it's confusing, but it has a small footprint. Mm -hmm. You can sort of kind of understand how it works. You can by uh, the, taking a look at what happened on the node side. You mm -hmm. can actually see what was done and why it was done. Mm -hmm. So debugging is uh, relatively easy. And I don't have a problem with this. Me neither. I have the problem with opaque uh, services that have, that have their own agents and that the agent does something. You don't know what, ha what, what was requested from the agent. You don't know what the agent, agent did. You mm -hmm. just have the error message. Yeah. And then you are into, into uh, you uh, ran, ran into problems and you don't know what to do. I'm, okay. I'm completely with you. Now I'm let's on. let's work with your... Uh... Uh, I, I just want to uh, share some recent experiences that I had with, with Ansible. I think you're going to find them to be quite useful, perhaps. So I've done a fair share of uh, Red, Hat, uh, Red Hat training this year, but I've done even more uh, stuff related to uh, VMware. And I had, last year was very active in terms of some of the things that are like um, on the horizon of NSXT services, stuff like advanced load balancer, for example, that VMware bought from AVI networks and whatnot. Just, uh, just, just a quick, uh, quick, completely side note, but uh, on the horizon, yeah. do you mean OpenStack horizon? No, do you mean no, VMware, hor horizon. V VMware horizon no, no, or no. the horizon? No, no, just horizon. <laughs> but a good, good one. Uh, that, that's actually very good. And actually, when uh, we were discussing in our DevOps episode, when we were going through the roadmap, you probably remember that I had a very loud reaction about the positioning of where load balancers are on that roadmap. And there's a reason for that. And it's not uh, VMware or Red Hat or whatnot related, it's uh, truth related, because load balancers are fundamentally one of the most important services that you have in modern applications. Without them, all of your containers can go bye-bye. 
That's it. All of your front ends can be forgotten. So I embarked on a journey of trying to work with some other stuff that are not just Linux related with Ansible. So, you know, usernames, passwords, secure shell keys, services, adding packages, firewall configuration, whatnot. Basically, I wanted to do a little bit more than using Ansible uh, as a group policy, if I can use that metaphor. And I know you understand it because it's kind of like that, that metaphor works. So um, when I did one of the courses a couple of months ago for Avi Load Balancer, I had a very, very good crew of students there who are who have a lot of experience with your f5s and uh, citrix net scalers and traffic and a couple of others load balancers and actually uh, because of the fact that they had so much prior knowledge we were able to finish the course a little bit earlier and then we started playing around with uh, alb and ansible because they were very interested in that they are uh, ansible shop not a terraform shop that's a Usually it's one or the other, but there are situations in which people go one way or the other, uh, having in mind the modules, for example, that exist for various third party services. I was super surprised. VMware has a GitHub uh, location with enormous amount of examples for uh, Avi Load Balancer, which is like configuration of virtual services, configuration of server pools, configuration of load balancing hashing methods, configuration of persistency, you know, your stick, stickiness, all of your, um, you know, cookie based approaches, whatnot. And then um, also in the episode that we uh, that we did about the uh, with, when using the roadmap, I talked about the fact that there are like six or seven different places on the in the path of that load balancer inwards. So incoming and outgoing where you can actually manipulate the traffic, especially if we're talking about the most common traffic nowadays, which is HTTP, HTTPS. All of that can be configured with Ansible as well. Uh, the uh, SSL certificate management can be done via Ansible. Basically like 99% of the most boring things ever to be done on a load balancer can be done with a couple of Ansible um, YAMLs and you can be very happy with that. So that's one example. And we've spent a very, very joyous afternoon of actually trying to kind of like create a couple of uh, things with that. Like uh, we uh, wrote a question, like uh, like an exam task. We need to deploy a virtual service with this, that, 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 that like 20 different okay. uh, configuration items. And in a couple of hours, we did that from scratch, no problem. I, I was by far the most fluent in Ansible. And so I, I was just like trying, trying to guide them more than to actually write the code. Then after that, I had an experience of doing something in Azure as well, not Linux based necessarily. There are quite a few uh, modules available for PowerShell for Ansible as well, which can, uh, they can be really very, very useful. That's my second use case. And also a couple of uh, weeks ago, I did some configuration for Cisco switch and a Fortinet firewall via Ansible as well. So okay. they, uh, both, they have a lot of modules both of these manufacturers do. So for me, I mean, I also have no problem with Ansible and to your point, troubleshooting Ansible for me is the most, uh, let's say, enjoyable time troubleshooting that I have to do in IT. Reason for that is because I use, just like you are, you use a lot of verbosity when I uh, start the Ansible playbook, when I try to do make something work and Ansible is quite verbose and it's humanly readable. And Not the main, the main thing event is that logs. It, and it's transparent. Very transparent. It, it does, yeah. it does everything it does. You can just simply say, okay, just put this into the log and you can see every and each command with all the You can parameters. do handlers, you can do error handling, you can check the logs. So, so basically you, you have everything that has been done, including things that are uh, error handlers that are also trying to make sure that the thing has been done uh, correctly. So uh, Ansible, Ansible, I have no uh, no problem there. With Windows uh, and PowerShell, I have one just small thing, and that is that Windows I simply cannot, for the love of, love of me, I don't understand why they cannot agree on the particular PowerShell uh, uh, power, PowerShell version. Com based when, uh, .net and the, so, PowerShell version. And they tend to change a lot of yeah, comments arguments. Uh, and arguments uh, on the on the fly, and this means that Ansible is not uh, as powerful as it could be. It could be 
because it spends a lot of time uh, wasting time trying to understand what is currently happening and which version of which uh, okay. uh, command do you have. Hence the reason why some, some uh, one of the latest additions in Windows Server a couple of years ago was the SSH server in Windows Server. Yes, you know, I'm, so use, I'm, is, I'm using it now every day. This is something that's probably going to fundamentally change the way in which we work. Especially it has changed. It has yeah. changed. Because I, have, uh, I had uh, an opportunity to use it I had a remote machine that was completely frozen up. Okay. Uh, it didn't respond to VMI. It didn't respond to uh, PowerShell, but it responded to OpenSSH server because it's a service that is not connected to anything else other than the actual kernel. Okay. And I was able to just reboot the machine. Mm, I actually... And it, it, it made me happy because actually I didn't have to waste time and try to re uh, remotely reboot the machine from whatever... Uh, so as I could. Uh, also, while you're on the topic of VMI, uh, a couple of weeks ago, VMI saved my ass. Uh, when we were when we got these new computers that uh, our company bought us, I wanted to do something remotely, and I didn't start the remote desktop, and VMI made it happen for me. It's really awesome too. Okay, the, that, that's the the thing that Microsoft does uh, the best is that since they have no idea what different teams are going to do in the future <laughs> they are uh, they have developed probably a dozen ways that you can uh, connect to a single computer mm -hmm. so it makes our job much easier yeah but also security is a problem there but uh, anyways okay now let's let's see what you have prepared for us because uh, this is going to last for a long time yeah we've done almost an hour now so these examples are going to be less than an hour <laughs> I just think that uh, maybe we should just, uh, perhaps, if you decide in the post that you're going to uh, split this into, into two things, no. may, maybe we can do a uh, different, uh, maybe we can do two episodes, one with the, us talking and the other one uh, that's just, examples. just the, the examples. I, I actually so, want to make this into a huge series. We're going to have more episodes okay, okay, okay. with just many, many Ansible playbooks and various examples that... I'm going to collect them as I work with some of the stuff that I do. You're going to collect yours. I'm okay. going to share them with the community and everybody's going to be happy. Okay, with that, I'm switching to my laptop now. So I have a set of four VMs uh, available here. They are going to act as my Ansible clients. I want to do something on them. And uh, the, the first machine on the top of this is actually a machine that uh, I'm using as Ansible, kind of like from which... I'm sending all of the necessary Ansible playbook configuration towards those four servers. I'm logged in in that machine now, and I've prepared a set of four or five uh, YAMLs and a couple of uh, comments that we need to make in order for people to be able to understand how all of this works. So the first part that uh, everybody needs to understand about Ansible is Ansible requires an inventory file. So if you look at the inventory file that I have here, I have a set of IP addresses. Four of those addresses, they correspond to the IP addresses of these VMs that I've just shown you. And also I made a group of servers for Ansible inventory called servers, which contains all four of them. This is uh, something that we're going to expand on in future episodes. We're going to create you know, child pools uh, of servers and we're going to create aggregated pools of service and we're going to span across multiple IP addresses and whatnot. There are many different notations available here, but I wanted to start with something simple. Yeah, just but, but to make it make it um, simpler, simpler uh, and explain it. Uh, uh, no, to, to, make it to make it simpler <laughs> to explain, basically it's just a directory of service that you want to uh, automate with Ansible. So if it's not in here, you have to make additional changes in everything. And if it's here, it just, you just, uh, it's reusable. It. You just call it by a group or you just call it by its alias and that's it. Yeah. So with that being said, I already made quite a few of these uh, commands previously. I'm just going to copy paste one because yeah, I'm being lazy today. So first playbook that I'm going to start, not necessarily right now, I'm going to stop it. Uh, it's called 01-hostname.yaml. I'm going to open it so that our uh, viewers can see what it does. And I'm going to explain one by one how Ansible YAML file looks like. So it starts with these three dashes. Then you start the playbook that consists of multiple small pieces of code that are called plays. The idea of plays is that you can combine many of them into one single uh, big playbook. 
You can do this in a variety of ways. I did it here by doing a, let's say, kind of like more of a static approach, multiple plays in one playbook, but you can also do this in a sense of having different files that you can include in one single playbook. We're going to cover that in one of the But I think this, the this, is the same, this is the same idea of, uh, as with any other uh, programming language. The idea is that you have you uh, you can either have one monolithic uh, application you, you, or you can have some sort of a, whatever it is, library unit or whatever it's called, yeah. that contains different functions uh, grouped by some function or some idea, some yeah. uh, uh, category. Personally, I much prefer it this way than including external ones, although that approach also has its value, no, no question there, because then I can treat this playbook as a set of things that one playbook can do. Which is what I aim to do with Ansible most of the time. Or to put more precisely, this, documentation. Base, this is documentation. Yeah, okay. I knew that you were going to go there. So basically, uh, what I'm doing here, I gave the name to this uh, playbook. Let's do a time zone and a host name. Gathering facts from Ansible uh, playbook means that I'm going to connect to remote host and get all of the information about them. You know, the, the distribution, the IP, NetMask gateway, all of the interfaces, all of the attributes of the remote machine. And what you, I'm going to interrupt you because we didn't actually say how uh, Ansible works. Uh, for those of you who haven't yet mm -hmm. uh, talked about Ansible, Ansible is simply a com pretty complex SSH uh, connector that uses SSH to connect to the other, uh, other side and then translates whatever you do into Python that then runs uh, commands that are applicable to a particular system. Yes. So basically what you're doing is you are instructing something, this thing is, uh, is the Ansible playbook uh, uh, a player, that is going to translate this into uh, a stream of commands. A stream of commands that are going to be replayed by a Python that is going to be deployed through the SSH. Correct, because Ansible is Python based. That that is completely. So basically, true. your your machine is going to connect to the other machine. It is going machines, to uh, multiple, or, yeah. the other machine or machines or group machines, whatever. It is going to then uh, start Python on, on the other side. It is going to start uh, the commands that it need, needs to start to uh, achieve this. And uh, the most important thing that you and uh, I need to uh, reiterate, this is uh, all state-based. Mm -hmm. So you are trying to achieve this state. Uh, it is desired state configuration type yes. of idea, just like PowerShell. So, so the idea is that you are going to tell to the machine, I need uh, the uh, web server to be running. Mm -hmm. If it's running, nothing's going to get done. If it's not running, it's going to get uh, run. And if it's not installed, it's going to get installed and then run. Yeah, the first uh, the first part of this is just some global configuration. Then we go into tasks, and these tasks are the plays that I'm going to do. First one uses a module that's called shell to remove a file for uh, cloud init meets uh, crazy network uh, network manager configuration. I'm going to remove a hostname file. Then uh, the second play is uh, setting the time zone by using a built-in time zone module and setting it to whichever location you have. The third play is about the copying of a shell script to a remote location. As I described previously in the episode, there are a lot of problems with setting the host name in accordance to your IP address and um, reverse qu DNS query from the DNS server. I want the uh, the host name of the server to be correct. I don't want it to use the template um, the virtual machine host name that's in the template. And I'm selecting the local file here to be copied to a remote file in a certain directory, which I'm then going to execute later. Uh, then I'm also making another change uh, in one of the configuration files in the remote machine, which is adding this script to be executed when, when booting. So RC local is one of the scripts that gets started last for a gazillion years in Linux. And then uh, we can also check the host name. So I'm just going to implement this by running the command that I was uh, that I stopped yes, uh, previously. So it gathers the facts. Show some, uh, show some information, starts connecting, starts uh, doing the things that it needs to do, blah, 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 and everything is done. So this is the core value of Ansible. It tries to do a procedural thing up to a desired state level. Desired state is defined by the YAML that we create, and then it tries to configure all of the hosts from the inventory that we selected so that they can be brought up to that level. 
so that they are basically uh, have the same configuration. So that's the first part. The second part of the story, uh, this is something that I did for a couple of our students that were in uh, Everskills competition uh, last week. Uh, they also had a task to do firewall configuration, but unlike what we usually do, uh, the, the question for this specific uh, competition was to use NF tables, not IP tables, not firewall D, not UFW, and okay. like NF tables, for reasons passing understanding actually, because this is by no means a very popular firewall nowadays, but not think, heavily used. Yes, but uh, NF I, know I, I, think, I think the idea was to make it future-proof, but uh, on the other hand, this is just uh, basically an academic uh, exercise. So uh, it is. It, it let's is be up to speed with the technology. Yes, yeah. is, let, let's let's use the technology that nobody else uses because it's yeah. going to be the next technology problem. And then I uh, started reading the documentation for NF tables module, and NF tables module doesn't really exist. There are a couple of third-party ones that don't have the capability to do what I need to do. There were a set of rules that were added in the question for our students that need to be implemented. And I found that the, by far the most, uh, let's say, efficient way to do that was to use a shell script, which is going to uh, issue a set of NF tables commands to add the rules to the NF tables configuration, then to create a, another shell script that's going to make those rules permanent because just like firewall uh, CMD and firewall D, it is a, let's say, transaction-based system which needs to be kind of like applied. And then at the end, uh, uh, also, uh, I, after the copying of the script, uh, it is going to start the script to make everything permanent. Actually, uh, this script was previously made for Ubuntu, well, for Debian. And the only thing that I changed from that version is that I applied a different module for the package installation. In Ubuntu and Debian, we have the built-in apt module while for Red Hat CentOS and whatnot, we have the DNF module, which corresponds to the command, stack of command names as well. Everything else is exactly the same. So uh, this is a point that I wanted to make. When you do a playbook, let's say development for certain distribution, it is usually something that's very easy to, uh, let's say, change slightly and then to make it work for a different distribution. There are only a couple of things that need to be changed, generally speaking. And when it comes to uh, this, what I actually extremely like about Ansible Agreed. is that you can also apply this to Windows. Yes. Uh, you can, uh, okay, uh, some modules aside, but you can also apply, uh, for example, a user configuration, SSH yes. configuration, everything else to Windows directly mm -hmm. just by using the Windows module. Yes. So it makes it makes a reconfigured Windows, especially right now when we have the SSH uh, uh, server, it makes some of the things that are uh that used to be i wouldn't say difficult but Boring. let's say let's Repetitive. say yes but it was complex if you wanted to for example if you didn't have the active directory and you wanted to uh, to reconfigure i don't know 10 different servers to have local users 10 of them okay that's uh, batch script was the way to do that the batch script still, but then you needed the way to deploy the batch script and yeah. you the way so the ansible is the way to just okay just we push it and that's it yeah. So uh, Ansible has its own merits uh, on its own, even when it comes to Windows world. Agreed. Yeah. Okay. I'm going to start uh, the uh, the playbook uh, that I just described as well. So this is the firewall configuration. It's just going to go through it. And uh, I actually didn't select uh, additional verbosity here, which I'm going to do in the next uh, Ansible playbook. And I'm going to do it deliberately because I'm going to make a change in the, uh, the next uh, YAML, in the next Ansible playbook. And I'm going to make an error by, uh, uh, by let's say, uh, not by accident, but on purpose. So I'm going to open the next one. And just for, let's say, fun sake, because again, this was developed for Debian. And on Debian, uh, the Apache web server, package names start with Apache 2, just like the service name as yes. well. So uh, because of the fact that I'm uh, applying this to CentOS, these VMs are CentOS, I'm going to use the DNF module, but I'm going to, uh, going to try to deploy Apache uh, packages on purpose because this is going to generate an error. Yes. So uh, Apache 2. And I'm going to... Uh, because since we are, I'm, I'm the one doing the, uh, doing the let's talk it, uh, talk it simple. 
for reasons that are too complicated to explain here, uh, Red Hat, CentOS, and everybody uh, on that side uh, page, uh, calls Apache HTTPD. Yeah. And the, most of the other distributions still use Apache. Uh, or Apache too. Yeah, Apache And they have it. a problem because they still use it, uh, to call, they still use it to, call, to call it Apache 2 and nobody has deployed Apache 1 for, for probably 20 years. 25 yeah. years yeah, or something. so. Okay, so now I'm going to actually run this playbook even without verbosity, additional uh, levels of verbosity. It would still generate an error and you would be able to understand from the error what the problem is. So let's first run it without, and then we're going to add verbosity. It's going to basically break apart as soon as it gets to the uh, addition of the Apache packages. So read messages, and it tells here problem con uh, conflicting requests. Nothing provides something, and there is no Apache 2 packages and whatnot. If I do it, this minus VV, which is double verbosity, you're going to get even more additional details about it. Let's see if it's going to be useful, or maybe even more. more no, more. You, uh, I don't think that you're going to get With any, more, any, any, any more, any more uh, additional uh, errors. Uh... Oh, there we go. I mean, I could go to this and check what the problem is. But actually, the, already the first, uh, tr uh, let's say, try to run this uh, playbook was more than enough to understand what the problem is. Okay, but this, in this particular case, you just created something that should be obvious to somebody who was using the, yeah. uh, both distributions. I did this on purpose, and I'm going to do it in one other example when we talk about uh, FTP server. So let's now start this, uh, this uh, without all of the verbosity, because it's really annoying and throws a lot of information on the screen, which it should be able to do, no problem. Now, basically, again, the Debian version of this just had Apache 2 instead of HTTPD for package name and then for the service name. Exactly the same uh, YAML, uh, exactly the same playbook. Cool. Actually, in uh, this specific uh, uh, Apache, uh, sorry, Apache uh, Ansible playbook. I also used Jinja template, a topic that we're going to cover in one of the future episodes. This is used if we want to customize the content of the files heavily, and there are other use cases, of course, but I use it here to have a, uh, let's say, specific content for Apache Web Server uh, for testing purposes, for nothing else. Okay, now I'm going to open the second uh, additional um, uh, Ansible playbook. And in this one, it was the, the task was actually to do something with the specific configuration of the FTP daemon. And when I was uh, developing this playbook for Debian, there is a slight configuration difference between Debian and Red Hat CentOS distributions in the sense that CentOS has the VSFTPD, FTP server, configuration file located in etc vsftpd directory, while Debian has it in etc directory directly. And when I tried to run this playbook against CentOS machines, of course, they threw me more than a few errors. So I'm just going to replicate those errors so that you can see them in your uh, with your own eyes. So I'm going to and this could be them. this could be probably solved with uh, using the facts and trying to uh, correct. Yeah, easily, to... but I didn't want to go into handlers and facts. Now we're going to do that in one of the future episodes. I'm just while this is running, I'm going to explain, try to explain what what I'm, uh, what it did say is that uh, the facts are going to give you the information about the system that your particular uh, system that the particular uh, playbook is running at right now. Mm -hmm. So you can actually get from those facts, you can uh, actually understand which version of the, which system the, uh, you are running at. Yeah. And you can create uh, loop. a loop. No, no, a yeah, loop. You uh, you, uh, or you, you are basically, basically uh, uh, creating a set of clauses that is going to say, okay, if we are running on this, this is going to be the here. And if we are not running on this, we are, this is going to be here. Yeah. So you're going to be just doing the same thing that we needed to do with uh, all the versions of Internet Explorer up to, uh, <laughs> up to its demise. Yeah. Okay, so you can, <coughs> you can clearly see the message that this playbook threw me. It says, and it cannot be more descriptive than this, destination etc vsftbd.conf doesn't exist. Okay, we have prior experience of, you know, many, many types of installations of VSFTPD. So we know that the problem here is the lack of configuration file and we would go and check where the configuration file is. 
I know from the top of my head that it's in ETC VCF, VSFTPD directory, so I could just change that. Yes, but the, the biggest thing that now I'm going to just mention is that uh, while you troubleshoot, yeah. you do not need to just troubleshoot here. You can connect the node directly. Yeah. You can, you can uh, take a look at the uh, log and see what has been sent to the machine. Yep. And then you can see uh, by hand, you can just simply, okay, say, okay, I'm trying to look at this uh, for this file. This file does not exist. Why? Mm -hmm. So even if you don't know what you're, what you're missing and why are you missing it? Yeah, best, no problem. Yes, and you uh, even if you don't know what you're missing, you can still understand what the problem is. Actually, the simplest way to do it exactly as you as you mentioned would be basically to secure shell to the host. Let's say one of them. I think it's one of those. You would maybe up, do update db to kind of like get a fresh database of all the files. Or you and can folders. just you can, or you can just say, do an ls and see where the file is. I could find yeah. But it's clear as day that the configuration file is in etc vsftpd directory, so the, the problem and troubleshooting Ansible in general not all that difficult. When you start dealing with uh, more complex things like with error handlers, etc., then it can be especially because of the syntax, not so much because of the code and the capabilities. Okay. And the only thing that I ever had with the, the problems with ever had with the playbooks was when I was missing uh, space indentation or yeah. or something, and it was trying to consider it, it was considering parts of the playbook uh, as being different things that it was expecting the, them to be. Yeah, it's this is something that's very annoying uh, when you have to do it. Basically, you could now you know just use a web browser to connect to these IP addresses of those servers and we would get the test the test web page which was configured by those by those templates that uh, i was mentioning earlier i think that the best thing that you can do with your playbooks is just to create uh, and start cockpit on uh, all of them and then just uh, create a, a web interface for all of them uh, get them to one cluster and that's it yeah sure i'm not going to do that right now but these are some of the simple examples of the stuff that you can do with uh, with uh, ansible we went through four of them and for some of the next episodes we're going to prepare more and then more and then more. and for me do one more thing okay. uh do not run a pl uh, playbook run just a simple i don't Check. know uh, host no no not just a, just a run a simple command like host name on each of the on each of the uh, files in the thank in, you for in putting me in a jam now because i uh, now you give me a chance to explain something that's happened here, which is very important. So I'm going to do exactly as you asked. Uh, because what name? you can do, you can do uh, impromptu uh, running. Uh, I can I can I can see your screen. Yeah. Uh, you cannot do. Uh, you can do impromptu running of uh, commands on all the uh, hosts in the inventory. So basically, what you can do is you can say, I do not want to run a playbook. I want to run a single command. Yeah, you can do it with uh, Ansible uh, directly without yes. any playbook options. I just secure shelled into these uh, these virtual machines so that you can see. So the host names have been started correctly. Yes. But uh, you can do that's the interactive mode on Ansible. Basically, just run a command uh, on a remote host. I just made it a little bit easier. But some, sometimes this, this can it actually saves you an enormous amount of uh, time because sometimes. Uh, what you need is just to, I don't know, delete a single file or just upload a single file from somewhere. Mm -hmm. And then you don't need to create a playbook. You just say, okay, this is the thing that I need to do, do it on all the hosts, and then you can pro probably do the next step from whatever. Yeah, I agree. Okay, that's it for, for me uh, and from me for this specific episode. Do you want to add something before we bring it to close? I think we should close it because we have covered more than enough. Uh, and we are going to see you in the next episode when we are going to cover what? Uh, advanced Ansible? We could. That's uh, okay. Or we could just be going back to the basics and uh, try to explain how the Linux works and boots. We could do that as well. I, I, think, actually... I, think, I think that we are missing, what we are missing is the, we are missing episodes on how the Linux boots. So if you have any ideas what we should do, Mm -hmm. uh, post in the comment section. Post in the comment section because we can do a lot of things, and we are more than capable of uh, doing them. But since we uh, have done so many lectures between ourselves, uh, we don't even know what people are uh, expecting from us. We 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 know how this is done, 
So it makes no sense for us to say, okay, this is how the Linux is installed. And at the same time, a lot of people want to understand how Linux is installed. So we have no problem with uh, creating any, any uh, content, but help us to go into the right direction and start with something. Actually, last week when I was doing that uh, LPI course for our selected client, you know, one of the things that I went through again for probably 200th time was the history of Linux booting systems. So I go, went to all of the, you know, system fee and all of the upstart things and all the system daemon. And actually I, as a result of that, because I was teaching that on a class as well, I created, I, I think I wrote like a 30 page document about all of that, which is more than like an overstatement of how it, important that is, but still very important. And we could do an episode basically of the timeline of that as well, if we wanted to, how it boots with relations to different versions and then UEFI versus the regular legacy BIOS boot, uh, GROP configuration. We don't need to go Lilo configuration, that's too old. Mm, this is one of my idea, ideas, but let's 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 not go we're, there. We're gonna... A anyways, let's finish this thing off. Uh, thank you for being with us. I'm Yasmin. I'm Vedran, and we'll see each other in the next episode. Yeah. Thank you, bye. Bye.